So, uh, brother, do you want to uh, share the slides, please? <clears throat> All right, let's do it. It's still loading. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> a lot of people, they get stuck uh, on I, the trans. Yes. Before we begin, yes, we're going to have to see yes. your beautiful face. Sure, just one second. All right. I mean, of course, it's not, it's not beautiful, more beautiful than mine, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All <laughs> right. So okay. There it is. All right. So a lot of people they get stuck on the translation issues um, from uh, from the Greek, and they claim, oh, there are two different words for God used there. You know, there's theos and there's theon. Or um, should the last part be translated as a God, like the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible would say, um, or the God, uh, ha theos, with a definite article, right? Um, so the likes of Origen, for instance, in, in his commentaries, or Philo, they make a, a big deal about the fact that with the definite article, it actually would mean uh, the God of all um, existence, i.e. the Father, right? But... Um, and I think either way, um, it doesn't really matter much, and we will still have the same two main issues um, that we'd have to unpack in there that are in front of uh, you guys on the screen, right? A, the identity of the Logos. Who is the word um, uh, that is identified in there, right? And B, is the first God mentioned in the verse the same as the second God that is mentioned later in the verse? Right now, without fussing about the translation, as I said, um, let's um, dive into uh, how we can uh, interpret uh, this particular verse. Next slide, please. You're on slide two, right? Yeah, because I can't see the screen. Yeah, now it's slide two. Okay. Um, now, let's take the word, the word word there and replace it with the Son or Jesus, and the word God and replace it with Father or Trinity there, right? Why do I want to apply the law of identity to this particular verse, right? Because the law of identity is a self-evident truth. It provides logical consistency, avoids contradictions, gives us clarity and precision about a matter, right? Because words have meanings. And this is what we use in everyday life to communicate with each other. Plus, the way God also communicated with us is through his revelation. And that revelation contains words. If we take language out of the equation, we're basically tossing his revelation out of the equation too. Hence, the law of identity must apply to God and his revelation as well. Let's take an example. If I say my brother Ali over here is a tall, short man or that he's a married bachelor? Have I communicated anything about him? I might as well have not said anything at all, right? This is just gibberish I'm saying, like literally I, I did not add anything to the conversation, right? And yes, there are things about God that cannot be comprehended, but that isn't the same as asserting something totally contradictory about him. The only exception in language um, is made when an allegorical or a poetic language is used, uh, which must be identified before exegeting the text. Else we could run into a lot of um, problems, especially when it comes to um, religion and theology. Next slide, please. So as I said, to decode this passage, we have to first identify um, who the word is, and we have to decode who God is. So applying the law of identity, as I previously mentioned, we have two options that we get over here, right? In the yellow color that you guys see, I have replaced the word, word with the son and the word God with Trinity. Because that's how Christians nowadays understand God to be, a Trinity, right? Or Yahweh, but what is Yahweh? Yahweh is a tri-personal God for them. Right? So that's why I put Trinity in there. And this is what we get. In the beginning was the Son, 
and the son was the Trinity, and the son was Trinity. I don't even know what heresy that would be. <laughs> and and how many gods do we get there? Like four, <laughs> right? Now option two in green color. Um, I've replaced the word word with the son and the word God with the father, as it is mentioned in, in the Tanakh and also in the New Testament. And here's what we get. In the, in the beginning was the son and the son was with the father and the son was father. What does that sound like? Modalism, right? So here are two options our Christian friends will definitely not agree with, uh, no matter what sect they come from. Or, or maybe modalists, they might agree with, um, you know, the second interpretation. But generally speaking, Christians will not adhere to any of these options, right? As both are considered heretical, right? So the obvious question now remains, if this is how we see it, what did the author of John um, uh, mean when he wrote this in the first century? And how did the early Christians, especially towards the end of the first century, all the way up to the second century, the end of the second century, understand this passage? Or John 1, 3, where it says, to him all things were made. Or verse 14, where it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelled among, amongst us, right? The reason why we will stress on, uh, you know, only three particular verses within the entire chapter is because those are the ones really pertaining to um, the triunity of God. And that is where Christians try to assert that, you know, that is talking about Jesus. Maybe in the upcoming week or the week after that, whenever we decide to do part two, we might actually break it down verse by verse as well, right? But due to lack of time, we may not actually end up doing that today. Now, let's unpack this passage in its historical context first, right? Uh, next slide, please. So it all boils down to this, basically. Either the word is a son or he's not. And with two usages of the word God in the verse, as I said, is it the same God we're talking about or is it a different one? As we clearly saw earlier, that if we substitute the word son or Jesus, or Trinity in the verse, neither of them work, right? So essentially, we come up with four possible options that could have been um, used in the first century. And all these four views, or, or in the later part of the second, up, up until the later part of the second century as well. And all these four views that you guys are going to see can be found towards the end of um, the first century, by the way. Um, Next slide, please. So first option in orange color. It entails that the son and the father are the same. In other words, when the son got crucified, that means the father got crucified on, on the cross too. Those, these people that believed this were considered to be the um, modalistic monarchians. So they did exist in the first century. Now the second option on the top right in yellow color that you guys see, it entails that the word is the father, not the son. These people thought that there was something divine in Jesus in a sense that he wasn't eternally divine. Rather, he was adopted by God at his baptism. But there are no two natures in the man Jesus. There's God's wisdom in Jesus that worked through him, very similar to how God acted through Moses when he split the sea, etc., or he did any of the miracles, or any of the prophets did miracles, right? The people that held this interpretation, they were referred to as the dynamic monarchians, also known as the adoptionists sometimes. Um, Ebionites, in, in my, in my uh, um, uh, point of view, Ebionites could have been, um, you know, of, of um, this particular view. They, they may have um, interpreted this particular verse as this right? Um, gospel of John was not necessarily um, a, a gospel that they uh, upheld. Um, they had their own version of, of the gospel, but let's say if they had heard something like this, this is how they would have interpreted that. That's what I meant, right? The third option on the bottom left in red color, this interpretation was held by people who thought that the word is the son of God. He was a lesser God besides God the Father. 
And this lesser God took a human body in the form of Jesus at some point in time. Justin Martyr is the one who was the proponent of this particular view. Uh, theologians call these people Logos theorists or more specifically people who held Logos Sarx Christology. Sarx in Greek, it means uh, flesh. Okay. Now the fourth and final option on the bottom right. Now this interpretation says that there is one true God, the Father, but there, there was a lesser God with him. This lesser God in the fullness of time partnered up with this human man, um, i.e. Jesus. So when people were looking at Jesus, basically they were looking at two persons in him. There's the man who was miraculously conceived by Mary. And there is this lesser ancient deity who existed before the world was created. And God created through that particular deity. This is what the likes of Origen or Tertullian, they thought. Anyone that held this particular view, they were referred to as a Logos um, uh, Anthropos uh, Christologists, right? Anthropos means human. In Greek, so between um, you know the 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 um, Logos Sarx Christologists and Logos uh, Arthropro, uh, Arthropros um, Christologists, there is a very slight difference. You guys may have to read um, what I've written for you on there to understand the difference, or while you guys are like reviewing um, this this particular stream, you guys will understand what the difference is. Next slide, please. Real quick, I just wanted to um, add, like with, with these, just wanted to point out a reference, uh, so a little, little clarification for everyone. This idea of uh, the, all these ideas that um, is being mentioned is not anything that will be considered new in the Greco Roman world. And I don't know if many of you know about this one contemporary. Uh, contemporary of the uh, of the early first century, he would have been alive during the time of people such as Paul of Philo of Alexandria. Now Philo of Alexandria is someone that will be considered as a Hellenistic Jew. A Hellenistic Jew is someone that is of the Jewish is of the Jewish faith. However, they see it through the lens of Hellenism. Hellenism is accommodating the views, the principles and beliefs of Greek, of Greco-Roman culture. So it's it's as if you're they're looking at the the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, and they're putting on a Greek lens as far as how they interpret it. And even Fowler himself in his works quotes this idea of the word. And this Philo was believed to have died somewhere between 30 to 50 AD. Within that, most likely he died within the early, the early, um, the early 30, early to late 30s. So and in some of his works, and he is quoted by saying he is quoted by saying um, things that are tied to a lot of the verses that are mentioned in the Gospel of John. That's why even scholars are actually de would debate whether or not John got his inspiration for his gospel from the works of Philo. And one of his quotes that Philo um, in one of Philo's works was when he's talking about the word. He said that. Now the Im his one of his quotes is now the image of God is the word by all which the um, by which all the world was made. Does that sound familiar? And he also stated the shadow of God is his word, which he used like an instrument when he was making the world. And the shadow is the archetype of all things. Philo viewed the sun. So, so Philo called the Logos, actually, the firstborn, God's firstborn son, the lieutenant of the great king. And we see this is the view. And remember, again, Philo is a person who has used Greco-Roman Greco thinking into the religion of Judaism. And he interprets it as that. And we can see now this is something that's not real, that is not foreign to not only not even some of the Jews at that time, but all of the Greco-Roman world, which we will find out in our part two about how the pagans or the Greco-Roman um, normal normal thinking was tied 
to this idea of Hellenistic thinking or this idea of the of this um, logos theology. So, and um, Philo was a, a contemporary that was no different. Now, a whole a whole a whole group of people such as like the Jews were influenced by this Greco-Roman thinking. Philo of Alexandria being one of them. And again, which goes to the question, was Paul of Tarsus one as well, or was even the author of the Gospel of John one as well, because Philo was from Alexandria, which was in Egypt. Paul was from Tarsus, which was very close to Rome. Would they have been exposed to this idea of Hellenistic thinking? All we have to do is look at the evidence based on the works, things, such as what I just mentioned that's quoted by Fowler within the within the first three within the first 30 years of the first century has not been stated by or similarly been stated by the author of John late in the first century. The evidence shows as of uh, the evidence shows likelihood as far as where John got his inspiration from. Just wanted to add that. Yep. Zakala Harahi. All right. So next slide please. So let's basically summarize now. The, the top two um, were the two types of monarchians, right? The dynamic and the modalist monarchians. While the bottom two are the logos theorists, right? With subtle changes in their Christology. Now the top left, the word that is a son is a, is a different mode of the father, right? The top right, um, the word is basically an attribute, or you could say you could use it as a predicate statement for God, right? Rather than a statement of identity. It's an action or a wisdom of the Father, which is active through the man Jesus, right? Or any of the prophets, um, as it was in the past, before Jesus. The bottom left, the word that is the Son, is a lesser God besides God the Father, whom took upon a human body and lived as the man Jesus. Now, the bottom right, the word is a lesser God who lived in a mysterious union with the man Jesus, that is, two persons. By the way, no eternality mentioned by the likes of Justin, Origen, Tertullian, none of them. This eternality business did not exist in the first two centuries, um, not even up to the th uh, third century. It started getting more developed uh, with the whole controversy between the Aryans and the proto-orthodoxy. And um, we will speak more about that probably in the, um, uh, the, the second part of, um, of, of, of uh, John 1, inshallah. Now, the orthodoxy probably adopted the bottom right option and developed it further by adding additional elements in there. But remember, this is the first or, or second century we're talking about, right? Um, the proto-orthodoxy, the way they took this entire Logos theory was way different than how it was understood early on. But this stream is obviously not about how Trinity was developed. Um, uh, what we want to focus, is, uh, focus on is what the author of John meant when he wrote this particular um, passage or this, this, um, this chapter, right? Now, the top left and bottom left, they sound very docetic. In, in nature, right? What is docetism? Docetism, it was the idea that Jesus only appeared to be human, but wasn't actually a human being. In other words, God was puppeteering a human body um, that definitely wouldn't be a man. It's like um, if a demon takes over your body, that wouldn't mean that the demon becomes you. It's just that he's puppeteering your body, right? So, there is no concept of an actual human Jesus in the left two options, basically, right? So let's move to the top right option. So the word is not the son, and we're talking about the same God. And we talked about logos as being theos, or theon is just the same word, but used um, differently in, in um, Greek, depending on the context, right? then the word would be something like an action or an attribute of God working through uh, any of his prophets, or in this case, Jesus. So you have a man who is empowered by God, doing signs and wonders among you. Does that sound familiar? Acts 2.22, right? Uh, next slide, please. But wait, 
Um, what about when it says, um, and let's read on if we can find something other relevant information to help us uh, with the interpretation of this particular verse, right? When it says um, the, in, in verse three, all things were made through him, that is the word. And without him, that is the word, not one thing came into being, right? Also, we later analyze some verses in the Hebrew Bible or other similar literature around the same time when Gospel of John would have been written to see to see if they use same type of language, which may help us get into John's mind. Next slide, please. So why not start with Genesis chapter one, the Hebrew Bible, the point of creation? Is there such a concept used over there? Well, yes, there is. It says in Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and God said, so he's using his word, his command, right? God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, Christians usually come up with, oh, but it says um, there in verse 27, let us create men in our image. Contemporary scholars and, you know, all Jewish commentaries on this particular verse, they agree that God is probably referring to his divine counsel or it could be the um, the royal we that he's using, right? So the divine counsel would be his angels, right? And if we pay attention, even though he says, let us create man in, in our image, if in the, in the following verses, what does he say? But it proceeds then to say that he did it in a, as, as he uses singular pronoun. Well, the singular pronoun is used over there, right? The point is, how does God create everything? By speaking it into existence, right? I'm pretty sure that Muslims are already familiar with this idea, and so are the Jews, right? Also, it's not like the word was acting as a helper for God. It's not like a group project with two involved. And why do I say that? Uh, next slide, please. Another passage that sounds very familiar that would help us understand what I was see, saying previously is it's very similar to the passage in John. It's found in Psalm uh, 33, verse 6, which says, by the word of the Lord. So again, the Logos, right? The word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all their host by the breath of his mouth. And just like I'm speaking right now my words are coming out of my mouth. It's like my breath, right? That is coming out of my mouth. That is my logos, right? Then in Psalm 148, verse five, it says something similar. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, again, command by his word, right? And they were created. Again, God creates all by himself without any secondary agent needed. He says, create so and it comes into existence, right? Next slide, please. Now, let's look at some other similar verses in Isaiah, for instance, Isaiah 44 and 45. Uh, one of the verses that says, I made the earth and created man upon it. It was made with my hands that stretched out um, the heavens, and I commanded all their hosts. So again, not uh, we is used over there as just one entity, right? I commanded all their host. Thus says the Lord, your redeemer, you formed, um, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who stretched out the heavens alone. So again, he stresses over here, there was no other agent along with him. He was alone and he made everything. He a commanded and it came into existence who spread out the earth who who was with me he even says who was with me there was nobody else with god when he made um, the heavens and earth so we clearly see that throughout the old testament god's creating word or logos or his sophia or his knowledge isn't acting as a separate agent in addition to god yes there is a talk about this word but it isn't as a second person that came out of the first God or existed with him in the eternity past as a second agent, 
as Christians understand it these days, or under, some of the Christians understood it early on. Next slide, please. Now, what about the fact that it uses the pronoun he or him in the beginning two verses? How do we deal with those? Well, the answer can be found in Proverbs um, chapter 8 and various other um, first century or prior wisdom literature from, from the time of Jesus or even prior, right? In Proverbs chapter 8, we see that there is a mention of lady wisdom and the pronoun used over there is a she. She is in the beginning with the God, with God while he was creating the heavens and earth. And she's rejoicing. Um, and it even says that God begot her. Does that sound familiar to Christians? <laughs> right? So does that mean that God has a pre-incarnate God woman too that was with him while he was creating? No, the obvious answer is no. It is metaphorical language, much like how John uses it. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so where did this whole Logos theory come from? For keeping the presentation short, I'll, I'll give you guys a brief summary. Um, the proponent, of course, it, or, or the person that really popularized this idea was the likes of Justin Martyr, who was a former uh, Platonist. Now, even though he later converted to Christianity, but did he leave all of his Platonic ideas behind? Doesn't seem like it from, from his writings, right? According to this idea, uh, God the Father is too transcendent to create directly and doesn't operate in the material world within time and space and does not share any relational attributes with us. He must first produce out of himself a secondary agent, a logos, right? And then create through him. Next slide, please. And I think this is, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So this is the Philo of Alexandria uh, quotations that you mentioned, Brother Ali. If you want to add something in there, if not, we can go to the next slide. But yeah, this is the, um, so, and just want to point out again, the, correlation because when you read this when when you read then this is only but only a few of philo's quotes and again I'm just going to stress this out one more time Hel hellenism it wasn't all this concept of what philo speaks of to even later later contemporaries um in the second century like but what brother Fawad said with justin martyr these aren't things are not things that were foreign to the Greco-Roman world or the pagan world, as we would call it at that time. So if we look at how they all understood, how they understood these verses or these works, even from when they wrote it, we can see there is a lot of Greek or Greco-Roman thinking within not only their understanding, but also the works itself because, and I'll do this a little bit later because there are more quotes of Philo who again died around the early third, in the early first century around, he died, he was known to have died around the same time Jesus was historically was known to have quote unquote died, but we Muslims would say he never, he never died. So he lived around that time. So of course, and by the way, Philo was not just a random person in Alexandria, you know, someone who is not unknown. No, he was someone whose works were known throughout. He was very, actually very popular. He was one of those people as a quote unquote Jew, how he saw the Old Testament, his influence was not just within one particular area. He's actually very, very well known. If we, if we, if I was to compare him to today, he will be the kind of person that has any, like quote unquote a Jordan Peterson. I don't know if anybody you know, just that kind of person whose influences has been widespread. So his influence, even throughout the um the Hebrew or the Judaic world in Judea, would have been known through, throughout. And who's to know who's to show who's to sh who's to know who exactly he affected? We have we can look at them through their works. Like I would say earlier, Paul 
and the author, especially the author of John's Gospel, because when the words are also, are used almost ver, um, almost verbatim, and even the concepts are there too. The idea of calling the logos the firstborn son, it wasn't, it was no, it was in no other gospels except the Gospel of John, but it was also in the works of Philo around 60 years prior. Calling God, calling the logos the image of God is something that is known both in Paul's work and in John's work as well. And then of course using the word to make all things is in Philo's work, it's also in John's gospel. So we can see the correlation and it will be disingenuous to say, oh, that was just a coincidence. It will be disingenuous when the ideas are the same, you have to, when the ideas are the same and, it, and it's not just one or two, it's literally at least four or five. And again, if anybody would like me to add on more quotes from Philo of Alexandria later on, I'll be happy to do so. And ultimately, I would just want to end this by saying, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, no matter what the duck says, it's still a duck. So if we see the evidence that is there and it's overwhelming, it's you have to say, yes, one person got their influences from someone else and the words are too close for it to be a coincidence. And this was the, this was two different works that was about at least 60 years apart, at least. So wants to show who influenced who, where's the influencer coming from. And again, this was not foreign, not only in the greco Roman world, but also as we can see, Philo being a Jew himself, it was also something that was known within the Jewish, the Jewish people as well. All right, so next slide. All right, so now what about the word becoming flesh in verse, uh, is it? 14 or 13? Yeah, 14. In verse 14, right? The or, or in some translations it says that it tabernacled or or um, um, uh, pitched his tent amongst his people or amongst us, right? Now again, do we have a similar type of language used in the Hebrew Bible or the perhaps first century or even prior wisdom literature or deuterocanonical wisdom literature? Next slide, please. The answer is yes. Let's take a look at Baruch or Sarak, or also known as Ecclesiasticus, right? Now, these passages are from deuterocanonical uh, literature that can be found in the Orthodox and Catholic Bibles till this day. Most of um, these have been tossed out of the Protestant Bible around the 19th century, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, early part of the 19th century. However, for the purpose of unpacking John 1, we will use these verses from the wisdom literature as they are contemporary to the time of uh, when John would have been written, which is um, the, the uh, uh, late part of the first century or prior to the time of Jesus. Now, Baruch 3 and 4, um, it says there's a verse there which is very similar that talks about how God's wisdom comes down to earth and lives among people, right? Or his logos, right? Um, in Baruch 4, it says, uh, she's the book of command, uh, commandments of God. Again, it's all metaphorical language, of course. It's not like God's wisdom or God's, uh, um, or, or, you know, God's wisdom or this particular attribute of God turn into a female uh, you know, a goddess and became a scroll and started walking around people. It's a way of saying that God revealed his knowledge, his wisdom, his ways through those writings of the scrolls, right? Next slide, please. Now, in the book of Sirach, also known as Ecclesiasticus, we have a, se a similar metaphorical language used. Right, wisdom or the logos comes from the mouth of God and finds a resting place. Right, so he it tabernacles. By the way, in some of the translations, including John and Proverbs, um, whenever it is uh, it, logos is always referred to um, with the pronoun it in some of the earlier translations. But you know, um, it doesn't really matter as long as we know what how. Um, you know, these early Hellenistic Jews probably understood this or the Jews, the first um, uh, temple Jews uh, uh, or a second temple period Jews, they understood this. 
it's okay even if we're using personal pronouns as he or she. That's fine because it's allegorically used, right? Um, in another verse in the same chapter, it says how God who created her assigned a place for her tent and uh, made her dwell in Israel, right? Next slide, please. Now, here we have some passages in the Old Testament where God's glory or his spiritual presence dwells or tabernacles with people in um, Exodus and Numbers, 2 Samuel, etc. Same type of language being used over there, right? Not to be taken literal. Next slide, next slide please. Now, this word of Logos is used all over the Old Testament, right? Um, Isaiah 55 says, this Logos comes down from the heaven, from the mouth of the Father, just like rain comes down from the heaven. But it is actually active. It's not arbitrary, right? It's, I mean, it's not abstract, sorry. It's not abstract. It achieves what it was sent for, right? Then we have this other passage from John in chapter 10, where the Jews stone Jesus and Jesus asked them, why are they stoning him if, the, if he has shown them um, great works? And they respond by saying that it's not for the um, great works, but rather that he's claiming divinity. But Jesus doesn't agree with them, right? Instead, he tries to clarify to them by quoting Psalm 82 that the word logos came to them and they're referred. So the people are referred to as gods, right? So, so the idea is that anyone that personifies the word of God can be referred to as God, right? So be it Jesus, be it Moses, or even regular people, right? Or John 14, where he simply... Um, uh, is trying to imply that anyone that keeps his word, again, the same word is used over there, logos, or the command of God, um, God and Jesus will love them, right? Also, by the way, a fun fact for you guys, not once in the entire gospel of John is Jesus referred to as the word of God. He uses, excuse me, he uses many extraordinary uh, titles for himself, right? Uh, I'm the bread of life. I am the light of the world, right? But why doesn't he use the most important title, which according to Christians would be the word of God? Why doesn't he call himself the word of God, right? Not to mention that, by the way, this is a prologue of another person, right? Not even the apostle John, but that's, you know, something that we don't have to get into right now. Right? This is a prologue. This entire chapter that we're reading, it's a prologue. It's not the words of Jesus himself, just to point that out to you guys. Next slide, please. So there's a term that is used um, in Greek, tapanta, in verse three, which you know, which which means all things. Christians seem to think that Paul teaches this idea. Um, so whenever they read this in, in the Gospel of John, they think, oh, well. Paul already is alluding to this particular idea, so it must be talking about, you know, the creation of all things as cosmos and everything, right, as in the Genesis creation, right? But it is done through a secondary agent, according to them, right, um, that God himself did not create it, right? So in, in Paul's epistles, this particular term, tapanta, which means like all things, it's like loosely used all over, and um, it's it's a very commonly used uh, term in in uh, Koine Greek, and um, you really have to look at the context of um, how it is uh, used, uh, else it could be really misunderstood. One commonly quoted passage is First Corinthians chapter eight, verse six, by by Christians, which says, "Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, um, from whom." All things, again, tapanta, came from uh, whom we live, and there is but one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things, again, tapanta, came and uh, through whom we exist. Now, if we analyze this entire passage in this context, right, what is Paul talking about over there? He's talking about, you know, 
uh, food sacrifices and dietary laws to you know um, if, uh, like food sacrifices uh, to to these pagan idols, then how does he all of a sudden switch to the Genesis creation? All of a sudden, it doesn't make any sense, right? The word all and none, uh, like they could be really uh, context dependent, right? Suppose if I say like my brother Ali over here, let's say if he um, goes to a party or something, right? And he enters over there and, you know, um, nobody recognizes him, right? So one person says to another, who is this guy? Well, I, you know, like nobody knows who he is, right? Does that mean that nobody in the entire world actually know who Ali is? Not even his family or friends, not even me, none of us? No, obviously. It's it's just we're, we're talking like if, if this term tapanta is used over there, or, or all, all things or all, all people, um, you know, would be talking about uh, Ali within that particular context, within that vicinity, that at that party, at that, uh, uh, you know, at that locale, nobody actually recognized him, right? Another one is 1 Corinthians 12. Um, that same term, um, tapanta, is used here again, but depending on the context, we have to see what is being talked about in there. Um, it says all things in existence, or um, in this context, we would um, say that he's trying to emphasize the activities, uh, which is the um, exercise of gifts within the body of Christ or something like that, right? Next slide, please. By the way, we will come back to um, um, the uh, first uh, Corinthians 8.6 uh, later on, because I, I have to unpack a few other things before going back to the first Corinthians 8 6 because that's an important one all right so uh which slide are you on yeah the second Corinthians that's fine okay so um once again we see the term tapanta used over here and um it says therefore if anyone is in Christ the new creation has come the old has gone uh, the new is here all this tapanta is from god who reconciled um us to himself through christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation right now something really interesting um but but before i get to the, the new creation part um what is all this referred to um being referred to over here it's obviously isn't referring to all things in creation and the cosmos right so what is he trying to basically say um, that they all came into existence? Is he saying that everything old, when he says everything old died, does that mean like everybody died, you know, or everything just finished, you know, and all came, all things came into existence again, like literally? No. Or is he just talking about something like, you know, a, a new covenant or like, you know, he's trying to put a, a spiritual spin on it, right? Um, a, a new covenant in Christ, like the term that is commonly used by Christians, like born again, right? By the way, this idea of the new creation, as I mentioned earlier, is something that we see you being used all over um, uh, Paul's epistles. And it's also used in Revelation. It is used in um, the epistle of John as well. It's used um, even in, in the Synoptic Gospels, right? And if somebody wants references, I can provide those references later on as well. Um, so Jesus is commonly referred to as the new Adam of this new beginning or this new creation, where the word RK is used in Greek, right? Um, and that's another context-based um, uh, word that needs to be analyzed thoroughly uh, within the context, um, else it can be misunderstood, right? Especially if it's if we're dealing with an allegorical passage or something, right? Um, due to lack of time, I'm not going to go in detail about this particular word. Um, you know, we might actually get into it in part two of this particular stream. So, um, and but just to quickly mention something else interesting, um, the, that if we observe all the synoptic gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, right, the idea of pre-incarnation of Jesus is completely missing, right? It's, it's not mentioned at all. It's only mentioned in John, by the way, right? If we take it the way Christians want us to take it, right? So John does not go in line with synoptic gospels. 
also, as we are, are seeing over here, that they think that Paul teaches this, but the way Paul uses this terminology is way different, and you can read within the context, and it will make more sense to you. So, um, uh, but by the way, in all of the Synoptic Gospels, there is a beginning, um, i.e., RK, the the Greek word used over there. So, all of the Gospels when they begin, right? This terminology is used over there, but what is it referring to? It's obviously not referring to the beginning of cosmos and beginning or, you know, um, uh, the eternality past or something, right? Uh, just like Mark starts the gospel um, uh, with Jesus' ministry, for instance, or when he's getting baptized, Mark, uh, I mean, Matthew and Luke, they, they start with the gospel with the birth of Jesus, right? So uh, we might go, as I said, deeper into this in the next stream, inshallah. Next slide, please. Now, if we try to interpret verse, the the one that we were looking at earlier, um, in 1 Corinthians 8, 16, um, it would go something like this, right? In, in light of, uh, you know, these previous other passages that, 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 that I mentioned. Yet for us, so who are the us? That is the Christians, right? The people that believe in the Christ. There is one God, the Father, from whom all new covenant blessings, like all new things, basically, or all things, sorry, all things, uh, tapanta, it's basically referring to all new covenant blessings, and for whom we live, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, again, tapanta, all new covenant blessings, and through whom we live. And why, so people might accuse me that, oh, you're, 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 you know, you're exegeting this, and you're not letting the passage read for itself. Well, to them, what I would say is read the entire passage in, in its context, and you will realize that this understanding, this interpretation makes a lot of sense, right? This reading would make sense because um, if he's talking about the old covenant and he's talking about the dietary law, right, as it wouldn't make sense as to why all of a sudden he's switching to the Genesis creation, right? in the middle of talking about dietary laws. But if, of course, if we approach it, um, uh, uh, you know, with the presupposition that it must be talking about some pre-incarnate, um, you know, son or Jesus, then yes, that that is the, the you know, pre-assumption. If I mean, that, that, that is the uh, conclusion that you will actually reach or you could reach, if especially if you take it out of context, if you only look at this verse. But if you read it from the beginning, you know, the, the interpretation that I put forward or put forth here in front of you guys, it makes a lot of sense because he is talking about the old covenant dietary laws. And then all of a sudden he introduces this new creation, the new covenant, the new blessing, right? Next slide, please. Now, if you're a Trinitarian, uh, Trinitarian Christian, you run into many problems with this particular passage that you guys see on your screen. Right, and we we often uh, point this out to uh, Trinitarians all the time. First of all, it says that the Son is the image uh, of the invisible God. If you're an image of something, you're not that thing, right? My image in the mirror isn't me; rather, it is just a reflection of me, a representation of me. But if you take it out in a metaphorical sense, like Jesus says in John. Um, I forget the exact chapter um, where he says, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Which the Trinitarians, by the way, love to quote, right? It goes perfectly in line with this particular passage. If you want to see God's heart, if you want to know uh, how he wants you to live, you just look at Jesus um, as he's the ambassador of God, his agent on earth, like all the prophets were during their ministry, right? Be it Moses, be it... Uh, uh, Joseph, be it Abraham, be it Noah, all of them, as they teach you the way of God, right? So God reveals the revelation through them, right? And they personify it by living it themselves, right? Another problem approaching the tapanta here in the context of of the you know Genesis creation within this uh, within this passage would be that Jesus referred over here as the firstborn of all creation. Again, no eternality mentioned over here. And 
how can a creator be referred to as a creation in any context, right? But if you approach it with the, the quote unquote new creation um, uh, theory as Paul means it to be, you don't run into any of these theological problems that, that are mentioned uh, before, right? And to further clarify later in the passage, he says, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Right. So remember the new creation that I referred to. So in other words, in his resurrection, a new spiritual creation began. Right. So the the first creation, which is the literal creation, started with the Genesis and with Adam. Right. And it went all the way up until the time of Jesus. And then when he was crucified, then supposedly that first um, uh, creation, the literal creation, it uh, reached its culmination and a new spiritual creation came into existence through Jesus when he was resurrected, right? And there are so many passages I can quote that, um, you know, refer to Jesus as the new Adam or the, this new creation concept is clearly mentioned in there. There's no ambiguity in there at all whatsoever. Next slide, please. So now let's take a look at um, those four options that we looked at earlier. Um, um, and, and the slides, right? In light of everything that we have learned so far so we can reach some conclusions, right? We can definitely rule out the top um, and bottom options as they're very docetic in nature and they just demonstrate that God is puppeteering a human body, right? Um, also in the first option, it'd be saying that God died, the, the modalistic uh, view, right? The second on the left at the bottom, which is like the you know, Justin Martyr was a proponent of this particular uh, theory. This would be subordinationism, right? So Christians, right off the bat, they're not going to agree with that, right? Even Unitarians, they're not going to agree with that because they don't consider Jesus as divine at all, right? So does that, uh, so so it leaves us just with the bottom uh, um, right option, right? Uh, and and, the, and the, the top right and the bottom right option, right? So what is the only plausible option that we can come up with? Because even with the bottom right, Jesus is, uh, is he's subordinate to God, right? And there are two persons that you're looking at in there, right? So um, the only plausible uh, option would be the top right, where um, Jesus is basically, um, sorry, the, the word is the father himself. And it's just basically a predicate statement about father, right? It's not pre-incarnate Jesus or anybody that lived with him. Rather, it is a personification of God's attribute, right? So um, just as all the previous prophets were, right? <clears throat> Next slide, please. So the word was viewed as a divine attribute or um, so, so it's just a conclusion now, now we're, we're coming up with, right? So um, uh, th these are the four main things that we've learned so far within um, the entire uh, presentation, right? That the word was viewed as a dif divine attribute or a manifestation of God's wisdom rather than a separate divine eternal being or anything like that, right? The personal pronouns, he or she, um, were commonly used to personify the, the logos of God in the first century um, and uh, almost all prior wisdom literature, right? You can find this in Proverbs, uh, um, Sirach, Baruch, Wisdom of Solomon, uh, Job's. Like there's, there were so many other passages that I could have quoted, but just due to lack of time, I only quoted some of them, right? Uh, wisdom of Solomon has so many of them, right? And it literally uh, is referred to as she and she lives among people or tabernacles among people, right? And so remember that uh, don't be so stuck on the he and she pronouns either because either way, the earlier translations, a lot of the earlier English translations, they referred to this logos as it, right? And the third thing is this uh, word or wisdom or Sophia uh, of God metaphorically dwells uh, among people, not literal, not, not literally, right? In the Hebrew Bible, we see this all over. Um, the Paul's new creation begins with Jesus's ministry, not the Genesis creation. 
as reading Genesis creation in there seems totally out of place and out of context. When read within context, you're not going to be able to make sense out of why all of a sudden he's alluding to the Genesis creation, right? Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> to, do, did you get to, yeah, right. Now, we're going to wrap up the entire presentation by showing you guys um, a similar uh, concept that we have in Islam. And you guys can see so many verses that are mentioned in the Quran where Allah creates uh, with his word. He says, be and it and it is, right? Um, just as God says in Genesis, let there be light. Or in Psalm where, um, that I showed you guys earlier um, in the presentation where it says that with his command or his breath of his mouth, he created the cosmos, right? So um, in the Quran, as it says in chapter 2, verse 117, the originator of the heavens and earth, when he decrees a matter, he only says, be, and it is, right? Uh, 36 chapter, verse 82, it says, his command is only when he intends a thing, and he says it, and uh, he says to it, be, and it is. So again, it's with his command he creates, right? Like we humans, we need, um, you know, uh, things to create, right? We need tools. We need uh, pre-existing things. We cannot create something out of nothing, right? Um, then in the 19th chapter, the Quran, it says, uh, it is not befitting for Allah to take a son. Exalted is he when he decrees an affair. He only says to it, be, and it is. So there you go. It debunks the entire platonic or even a stoic type of idea. That's why we don't use this terminology because we see this from early on. There's so much confusion, so much you know, uh, evolution that took place within this Lagos theology. So this is exactly why it's better to toss it out of the equation altogether. And that's exactly why in the Quran, Allah says that he's way too exalted to have a son. And we don't use this even in a metaphorical sense for that same reason. And then the last verse, and th there are so many other verses that uses this terminology, but it's just only a few of them. In the chapter 3, verse 59, it says, Indeed, the example of Jesus to Allah is like that of Adam. He created him from dust. Um, then he said to him, Be, and he was. Again, kun fayakun. And that will be it, inshallah.